Am I here? Is this right? I'm here. Okay. Uh, well, I am from Texas, so howdy. You're supposed to say it back. Howdy. Okay, that was good. You may not have a lot of uh, opportunities in your life to talk to someone who ran an abortion clinic, who worked in an abortion clinic, who knows kind of the ins and outs of the industry. And so I, I do want to give you an opportunity to um, ask a lot of questions. And generally, I feel like that's the best way for, for all of us to get engaged anyway. Um, for those of you that are here that have absolutely no idea who I am, um, I did grow up in New Roads. Anybody from New Roads around here? Oh, yay! Wait, did I go to school with any of you? No, okay. One? Who is that? <gasps> oh my gosh! Oh my gosh, okay. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, anyway, I went to school with her, y'all. <laughs> um, anyway, I, uh, I, I, I did work in, in Planned Parenthood for eight years. Um, I managed an abortion clinic there. Uh, a lot of times people ask me, you know, how, how in the world did you go from being this, you know, pretty good kid, this Christian kid, grew up in church. Um, I think, I mean, I, th I think in New Roads there were about 10 Protestant families and we were one of them. Um, <clears throat> but I, but I, you know, I, I grew up in church. I, I, I grew up believing in God. I remember saying in high school that I was, uh, that I was pro-life. Um, and, and so I didn't grow up in this home that didn't know God, that, that didn't talk about pro-life or anything. I mean, we didn't sit around the dinner table and talk about what pro-life meant or, you know, what do you say if, if someone comes to you and says that they are pro-choice? You know, how do you, how do you kind of go against that? What are the talking points? I didn't grow up knowing that. So, um, I mean, I can really say that I was, I was actually pretty ignorant in the literal sense of the word to abortion and the pro-life movement and, and the pro-choice movement and what all of that meant. Um, I ended up going to college um, at Texas A&M University. Um, if we were in Texas, everybody would be yelling right now, but <laughs> because we're here, it's like crickets. Um, but I did see one over there, one, yep. Um, so, uh, I, but I, I, I did go to school there and uh, when I was in college there, I was dating a guy, and um, not a good guy, and I should have listened to my parents, and I ended up getting pregnant. And I remember thinking, this isn't supposed to happen. The, you know, good Christian girls on birth, on birth control are not supposed to get pregnant, right? We're not supposed to get caught, but I was caught. And I remember, you know, going... <clears throat> uh, to him and saying, you know, what do, what do we do? I'm pregnant. And he just looked at me like it was no big deal. And he said, oh, that's fine. I'll just take you to an abortion clinic. I've taken other girls there before. And, you know, I would like to say that I, I thought in my mind, you know, ma maybe I can do this. Maybe I can be a parent. You know, it's not going to be easy. Maybe I could do it. Or, you know, maybe I, I would like to tell you that I, I thought about an adoption plan. Or, but I, I didn't. I, I didn't call my parents. I, I just said, okay. And uh, I went, I had a, a surgical abortion and uh, we drove to, to Houston, it's about an hour and a half away from College Station, and um, he dropped me off at the door. I walked in. I remember having, I don't remember a whole lot about that day, but um, I remember going into this group counseling session. I'm using counseling in a very loose way, but uh, I went in, and, and there was this woman there, and uh, she showed us a video. There were probably about 15 of us in this room. And she showed us a, a video about what the abortion would be like. And I guess when it was over, we all looked a little wide-eyed and, and nervous. And she started laughing, and she said, 
Don't worry, girls. I've had like nine abortions. You're going to be fine. And at that time, that actually did make me feel better because I thought I'm only doing this once, one time. And so if this woman has done it nine times, I'm going to be okay. I'm just doing it once. And uh, I went into the procedure room. I never saw the doctor's face. Um, he had a mask on. Uh, he never introduced himself to me. Um, in fact, I was already uh, kind of sedated by the time he came in. And uh, he never spoke to me. He did the abortion. Uh, I don't remember how far along I was. Based on how much I paid, it was, pro I was probably between 14 and 16 weeks. Um, and I remember waking up in recovery, in the recovery room, and I was sitting in this chair, and I was, I was slumped over, and I, I remember looking down the row, and there were, you know, all these girls that I had been in this counseling session with, they were all slumped over too in their chairs. And they got me up, and they got me dressed right there in front of everybody in the middle of the room, and they gave me um, a glass of tap water and two saltine crackers and sent me out the door and I waited outside for my boyfriend to come and pick me up and we made the hour and a half drive back to College Station in silence and we never talked about it again. And I thought, well, that's, that's good because um, I can still say I'm pro-life Right? My parents will never know that I did this. My friends will never know. I never told anybody. And I can still say that I'm pro-life. I, I can, I can you know, still do things to, to make my parents happy, and they'll have no idea. I mean, this was just a one-time mess up, and I got a do-over, and, and that's it. And that's kind of how I looked at it. And um, about a year later, I met a woman with Planned Parenthood, and... She uh, asked me what I knew about Planned Parenthood, and honestly, I did not know anything. I, I grew up in New Roads. We didn't have a, a Planned Parenthood there, and when I moved to Texas um, in high school, we didn't have a Planned Parenthood where I moved, and uh, I'd never been inside of a Planned Parenthood. I didn't have my first abortion at a Planned Parenthood clinic, so I didn't really know anything about them. And she started telling me about all the services they provided and, and how they're this, you know, wonderful group of people that, that are helping these women that are poor and uninsured and indigent. And, and I thought, that is so sweet. You know, I thought, wow, this group, they are like a benefactor to the masses. How, why would I not want to get involved with this organization? And she then told me, she asked me what I thought about abortion. And um, I said, well, um, you know, I grew up pro-life. And she said, oh, that's great. She said, you know, what, what pro-lifers don't understand is that without access to safe and legal abortion, women would be forced to go where? You know, the back alleys, right? And that would be terrible because first, they're going to take away our right to have an abortion. Then what's next? They're going to take away our right to vote, and then all of a sudden we can't wear pants, you know? And it's just, uh, it's just a snowball, you know? And I thought, oh, man, that is, that's a good point, you know? I never thought about it. And um, she told me that, that Planned Parenthood, anyway, they only did like a teeny tiny amount of abortions, like 3%. It's like nothing. Remember how I said I was very ignorant to this position? See, I stood there and I listened to her tell me these things about Planned Parenthood, but I didn't know the truth. I didn't know the facts. And so I was very easily swayed to her position. See, when she told me that Planned Parenthood was the only place for poor women to go for health care, so I didn't know that was a lie. I didn't know that there are more than 10,000 federally qualified health centers across the country that see men, women, and children for comprehensive health care, not just gynecological health care. So I didn't know that. Compared to fewer than now 600 Planned Parenthood clinics. When she told me that, that women would be forced to go to the back alleys, 
See, I didn't know that what takes place inside of these safe and legal abortion clinics is no different than what happened in the back alleys. When she told me that, that it was only a teeny tiny percent, three percent of what Planned Parenthood did, I didn't know that that three percent equaled 334,000 abortions a year. So I didn't know that. When she told me that Planned Parenthood was there to liberate women, to educate them, I didn't know that that education meant going into kindergarten classrooms and teaching graphic sex ed to five-year-olds. When she told me we were there to empower women and Planned Parenthood was there to protect women, I didn't know that that meant that I would be helping to facilitate abortions on young women who were trapped in the sex trafficking industry. So I didn't know all of that. And I, I don't know, I can't tell you exactly how it happened. I, I can't tell you exactly how I went from, you know, this one extreme to another, but I can tell you that it happened just bit by bit. Just a little tiny bit at a time because that's the way that sin works. And I, I, was, I was enjoying my job at Planned Parenthood. I believed I was doing the right thing. I believed I was helping women. And uh, I, was, I was rising up very quickly in the organization. In fact, I was, uh, I was the youngest uh, clinic director there at my affiliate, possibly the youngest in the country at the time. Um, I was awarded Planned Parenthood's Employee of the Year Award. I know you're very impressed. Um, <clears throat> but I was. I mean, I, I felt really good about myself. I felt like, you know, I've, I've hit kind of the, the peak here of my career with Planned Parenthood. I, I worked for Planned Parenthood Gulf Coast, which is the, the affiliate that owns the two here in Louisiana. I was excited about merging with the Louisiana affiliate. I thought, oh, that's great. That's my homeland. I, uh, we're going to be managing those clinics, too. And... Um, I was really happy. I thought I was happy. I didn't realize that my career with Planned Parenthood was separating me from my family, separating me from my husband, who was always pro-life. So that made interesting dinner conversation. Um, I didn't see how it was damaging myself and my soul. And um, I have to tell you, there were a couple things that happened. The first thing that happened was uh, I, when I worked at Planned Parenthood, I had a line in the sand. Most people who would consider themselves pro-choice have this line in the sand too. Most people that are pro-choice, and the way that I felt was if you abort a baby after viability, then it's murder. Okay. That's how most pro-choicers feel. You don't abort viable babies. And so I had proclaimed to all of my friends and the people that I worked with and my family, I would never work in a clinic that did abortions past the point of viability. Well, then one day I read a really scientific article in People magazine. And it said that it talked about this little girl named Lily who was born at 20 weeks and six days. And she was fine. She survived. She's healthy. She's happy. I think she's like, I don't know, probably five or six now. And I thought, uh-oh, I got to move that line in the sand now. It's not 24 weeks now. According to People magazine, it's 20 weeks and six days so anything after that is, I can't participate in that. Well, then, Planned Parenthood Gulf Coast, we were building this huge abortion clinic, right? The largest abortion clinic in the Western Hemisphere. It's in Houston. It's seven stories tall. It's 78,000 square feet. It cost $17 million to build it. And, uh, and we were going to be doing abortions up to 25 weeks gestation. I thought, oh, no. Now what am I going to do, right? Now, oh man, now what? 
And I, you know, I don't really remember how I justified it. I think I talked to some of my friends about it that worked at the clinic and they said, well, Abby, you know, better for them to abort viable babies than to put them in the dumpster. And I thought, that sounds good. Okay. I can, I can make that my own. I can, I can justify it that way. And so I did. And then a few months later, I had a meeting with my supervisor and, uh, we were looking over my budget and she was telling me that they were going to double the amount of my abortion quota. Every, every Planned Parenthood clinic, um, every abortion clinic really has a quota for the amount of abortions that they must provide. It's how they come up with their annual budget. Um, and we had never had a problem meeting my quota. We were all very good sales people. We were, it was easy for us to sell abortions to people. So that had never really been an issue, um, before, but I'm looking at my budget and I'm seeing that number has been doubled and I'm thinking, oh, okay, we're going to have to really ramp up the selling. But that didn't make sense to me because I had been a media person for Planned Parenthood. I had stood in front of TV cameras and had talked to print media, uh, reporters, and, and I had said that our goal at Planned Parenthood was to reduce the number of abortions. That's what, that's what they say. I mean, you're never going to see a Planned Parenthood commercial where they go, we are so jazzed about all those abortions we provided last year. They don't do that. In fact, if you walk into a Planned Parenthood clinic, you won't see one piece of material out in public view about abortion. They don't have it out. I mean, if it's so wonderful, why hide it, right? And so I didn't understand. And I, I remember saying something to my supervisor. I remember saying, you know, well, I don't get it. I don't understand. I thought we were trying to reduce the number of abortions. And, and she said, well, Abby, that's how we make our money. And now, to you, a group of pro-lifers, you're looking at me and going, well, duh. <laughs> but... I was genuinely shocked. I, I had no idea that all of a sudden this was about money. I mean, I should have known, right? Because we would do 25 to 50 abortions a day. And, you know, then <clears throat> the day after we did abortions, I would take all of the money to the bank and I would usually have, you know, 15 to $25,000 in cash. I knew it was a lucrative business, but I don't know. I mean, I, I was just so blinded. I and mean, that's, that's what sin does to us. It just makes us blind to the truth that many times is right in front of our face. And so I, I left that budget meeting with my supervisor thinking, clearly she did not have her Starbucks this morning or something because we are not about selling abortion to women. I didn't realize at the time that the only reason I got that Employee of the Year award because, was because I was the best salesperson. And so about a month after that meeting, we had a, a physician come in from out of town. He's a private practice abortionist. He owns his own clinic. He and his wife are the only two people that work there. In fact, they live inside of the abortion clinic. And uh, he came very highly recommended to us. And uh, something you should know is that most abortion, there are very few full-time abortion providers. Most abortion providers are what we call circuit rider abortionists. So they just travel from one abortion clinic to another. They have full-time jobs somewhere else. But see, they don't want to be responsible for patient care. So they work full-time somewhere, and they let the staff, the mid-level staff, or the non-medical staff deal with medical emergencies that take place after abortion. And they go back to their regular job, and they just come in once a week or whatever it may be, and they make, I don't know, three to $4,000 for four hours of work, so that's not bad money. And uh, abortionists generally get paid, at Planned Parenthood, they get paid $75 per abortion. So it's a, it's a commission-based job um, for the physician, so they want to try to get in as many as possible. And so... Um, this doctor came down, and we were going to try him out and see if we wanted to put him on our regular rotation. And he was explaining to me that during 
at his clinic while he performed abortions, he actually used an ultrasound during the abortion procedure. Now that was new to me because um, Planned Parenthood's protocol states that abortions will be done as a blind procedure. So they have an instrument called a cannula that it's like a, um, a straw. Uh, it's, it, sometimes it's rigid, sometimes it's flexible, depends on how, how big the opening is. Um, they're graduated, they're bigger and smaller depending on how far along the woman is in her pregnancy because they have to be able to fit the head through the baby's head through the tube. And, um, and so that cannula is then hooked up to a suction machine and the physician will <clears throat> take the cannula and they will blindly probe around in the woman's uterus until they think they have enough blood and tissue in a glass jar. Um, that glass jar then goes through a pass-through in the wall, one of those turny things in the wall, um, that connects to the POC lab. Now, POC stands for what? Products of conception. What's that? It's a baby, right? But you can't say baby inside of an abortion clinic. So we said POC or, or POC, or when the staff was feeling funny, we would say that it stood for pieces of children. And so the POC technician inside of the POC lab would dump everything into the glass jar, everything out of the glass jar into a glass Pyrex baking dish. They would reassemble the parts of the baby back together to ensure that we got everything because if we left part of the spine or the head or a foot inside of the woman's womb, she could develop a very serious infection that could be fatal to her. And uh, then the POC technician would dump everything in the glass baking dish into a red biohazard Ziploc kind of bag. And then that bag would go into a freezer with all of the other babies that had been aborted that day. And we used to joke and call that freezer the nursery. And then once a week, someone from Stericycle or a biohazard waste company would come to the clinic and they would pick up all of the little red bags and they would take them to a facility where they are burned. And that's the way that abortions are done, day in and day out. Some clinics, uh, there's a, an abortionist in Colorado, actually, um, Dr. Warren Hearn, he performs abortions up until 40 weeks gestation. And um, that's legal uh, in our country. There's several abortionists that perform them up to 32 or 34 weeks. He's the only one that goes up to 40. And uh, these, these late-term clinics usually have an incinerator built into their POC lab so they can burn the babies right there on site. And that's the way that it's done. And I, that's the way I knew it to be done. I was trained as a POC technician. I used to do that job. Um, I would like to tell you that it bugged me to do it or that I had all this internal angst or turmoil about being a POC technician, but I didn't. I actually enjoyed that part of my job. I guess it made me feel more medical. And so this doctor uh, was telling me about using ultrasound during the abortion. And now we always used ultrasounds before. We had to use an ultrasound so that we could verify exactly how far along the woman was in her pregnancy so we knew how much to charge her for her abortion. It wasn't really for anything medical. And, but when we did the ultrasound, you know, we would try to already have her sedated um, and we would move the screen away from her because we couldn't take the chance that she would actually see what was on the ultrasound screen because um, then she may change her mind. You see, the ultrasound exposes the lie of the abortion industry. And so we had to make sure that these women didn't see their ultrasound picture. And um, sometimes we would, we would have already taken the, you know, $450 if we thought she was under 10 weeks. And uh, we would get in to do the ultrasound and we would find that maybe she was actually... 12 weeks and she owed us 200 more dollars and so someone would be tasked usually the last person hired um, to walk in to the room while the woman's on her back 
um, legs in the stirrups and the most vulnerable position a woman ever is at the doctor's office and um, say, now listen, you're actually a little further along than we thought. So uh, we're going to need to collect $200 from you. Now don't get up. Is it in your purse? I'll grab it for you. Really? That happened hundreds of times while I worked at the abortion clinic, and I can tell you never once did the, the woman not come up with that money. Because they were right there at the finish line. They were going to have this done. And so um, I, was, I was asked to be in the room. This doctor was going to show me what an ultrasound-guided abortion look like. He said using an ultrasound is better because it helps him, in his words, visualize his target. And uh, he needed literally an extra pair of hands to hold the ultrasound probe on the woman's abdomen during that abortion. And, and so um, he wanted to show me something good. You know, I mean, I was planning to be the COO of this affiliate, so I needed to know what was going on. And uh, so I, I stood there and I held the probe in place and um, on her abdomen and we did the measurement. She was 13 weeks pregnant. At 13 weeks, are there arms and legs, fingers and toes, heartbeat, internal organs? Everything's there. Brain waves are going outside of the womb. The baby's about this big and we can even tell if it's a boy or a girl. Now, I knew that because I, I had been a POC technician, so I had seen the aftermath of abortion. I had seen the most graphic part of abortion, so I thought, nothing's going to shock me. You know, I've, I've seen the worst of the worst here, so nothing's going to surprise me as I'm, I'm doing helping with this abortion. And I had been inside of the abortion room before. I had held women's hands as they were having their abortion. I had helped them breathe through the pain. I had dried their tears. I'd even taken a couple of blood pressures during the abortion procedure, but I'd never really been at the business end of abortion. I'd never actually assisted a doctor during the abortion procedure. And admittedly, I was a little nervous because, I mean, I'm looking at the ultrasound and it looks like a baby. I mean, it can't be because Planned Parenthood said it's not. Now, when I was pregnant with my daughter, I have a, um, I have a almost seven-year-old daughter. I have a 15-month-old son and a four-month-old son. Yes, we are busy. Um, and I, I was pregnant and had my daughter while I worked at Planned Parenthood. And, uh, and so, I mean, when I was pregnant with my daughter, it was a baby. But maybe it was a baby because she was wanted. I mean, we didn't have a fetus shower when I had my baby shower, right? I mean, we had a baby shower. It was a baby. I remember thinking that I was miscarrying at one point in time, and I was sad. And my mom was like, well, I don't understand why you're sad. It's not a baby, right? She's my mom. Mm. She wasn't trying to be rude, but she was just trying to get into my head. Like, what are you thinking? It's not a, you, you're saying it's not a baby, but it was a baby. When it was my baby, but maybe it was just a fetus or, or POC or, you know, whatever, when it was unwanted. I don't know. I hadn't really figured that out yet. I still really haven't. But I, I knew one thing, even though I was feeling a little anxious, I knew one thing, and that was that this fetus would not feel anything during the abortion procedure. Now, how did I know that? Because Planned Parenthood sent me a memo, and the memo was entitled Answers to Tough Questions. And the number one question that I got asked from women who were having abortions was this, will my baby feel this? They wanted to know. And they wanted to, to try to understand, was there humanity in this child that they were caring? I never had a woman come up to me and go, I have got to get rid of this fetus. They never called it a fetus. They always called it a baby. They knew it was a baby. And they wanted to know if this baby would feel pain. 
And Planned Parenthood knew that they had to come up with a very good answer because there was no way I could look at women and go, well, it could potentially be very painful. Now let's get you ready in exam room number one. Right? That wouldn't happen. That would be inhumane. So we had to come up with a better answer. So our answer to that question, the scripted answer that we were to give back to these women was this. No, the fetus has no sensory development or does not feel anything until 28 weeks. Now, do you believe that? No? Well, I did. And I should have known better, right? Because I remember being pregnant with my daughter and my daughter is very <clears throat> strong-willed. She gets it all from her dad. And um, I remember when I was like 22 weeks pregnant with her, she was really, you know, kicking me a lot. And it would get on my nerves. And I would poke her and she would kick me back. Because she could feel what was taking place inside of her home, right? So I knew better. And these women, when I gave them that scripted answer, they knew better too. 60% of women that have abortions already have children at home. We knew better, but we had to believe the lie because the truth was very inconvenient. And so I'm standing there and I'm reciting this, this scripted answer in my head, trying to make myself feel better. And I watch as this instrument goes into the woman's womb and this cannula, the suction was not yet turned on. And I watch as it goes right up next to the side of his body. And as soon as it gets close to him and touches him, he jumps. And he begins to flail his arms and legs as if he's trying to move away from the instrument, but there was nowhere to go. And the doctor asked for the technician to turn on the suction, and he said, beam me up, Scotty. And the suction was turned on, and I think people make the assumption that what I saw next was the worst part, that seeing a child become dismembered and torn apart in his mother's womb would be the worst part, but I knew that was going to happen. I think most of us know that. Most of us have seen the graphic images. We know what abortion looks like. That wasn't surprising to me. That wasn't the worst part. The worst part was knowing that I just stood there and watched. I did nothing. I remember wanting to, to sit this woman up and, and say, look, look at your baby. He needs you to protect him. They're hurting him. I remember wanting to do that, but I didn't. I just, I just stood there. And um, after it was done, I went back to my office and I didn't feel horrified. I, I felt shocked because I knew that I had been lied to big time. And that really wasn't as bad for me. What was worse was that I had then in turn lied to thousands of women. I hate liars. And at that moment, I was the biggest liar I knew. And I, I didn't want to leave my job. I made a lot of money at Planned Parenthood. I lived a really comfortable lifestyle. My husband was a teacher, so we just say he worked for our insurance because, you know, they don't make any money. And, uh, I mean, I was the breadwinner of our family, and I didn't want to leave. I tried to justify it in my mind. I tried to make it okay. But in the end, I just, I couldn't. And about a week had gone by, and I was sitting in my office, and I was watching these women go in and out. And I was watching them through my window, and they were carrying little brown bags, and I knew that we were doing medication abortions that day, the RU-486 pill. 
And I thought, I'm still doing it. I'm still here. I'm still doing this. And I, uh, I started praying, and that was the first time I'd really done that in a while. And I was asking God, I was like, just please give me somebody to talk to about this because all my friends were involved in the, in the pro-choice movement, all my close friends. Um, my parents were on vacation, and my mom is not very good in crisis anyway. That would make her very nervous. So I didn't want to ruin her vacation. So I thought, what, you know? What am I going to do? My husband was pro-life this whole time, so I thought, I, you know, I can't go to him. I don't want him to look at me and be like, I told you so. So I thought, what am I going to do? And I looked out my window, and I saw these two women. They were out there praying out in front of my clinic. They were out there. People were out there every day during the eight years I was there. Um, it was during the 40 days. It was during a fall 40 days for life campaign. And so they were out there, and... Um, I felt like God was telling me to go to them, and I thought, no, give me somebody else, because I have not been very nice to them, and uh, I do not want to go to them, but I just, I was like, please, somebody I haven't talked to in 50, 15 years, just get, you know, anybody besides them, but I just kept feeling like I needed to go to them, and so I, I got in my car, and I uh, drove over to their office, which was conveniently located next door, so I could have walked, but um, that would have been suspicious. So I drove my car the 50 feet next door, and um, I, I called them. I was sitting out in my car. I was crying, and I, I called them, and the lady that answered the phone, Heather, she said, Brass Valley Coalition for Life, and I said, uh, this is Abby Johnson, I'm Planned Parenthood director. Of course, I didn't have to say that. She knew who I was. And um, I said, I, I would like to come in and, and talk with someone. <laughs> and she said, can you hold on, please? <laughs> and, uh, and I said, yeah. So I actually started laughing and I was thinking, oh my gosh, I don't know what the conversation is like inside of there right now. But, um, <laughs> but I, uh, she came back on the phone and she said, okay, we'll, we'll meet you at the back door. And so uh, I walked up to the back door and they opened the door and there were three of them standing there like this. <laughs> like maybe I had a bomb strapped to me underneath my scrubs or something. And I'm like, can I come in? You know, I can't even compose myself. And they're like, okay. And uh, they let me in, and, and that was it, you know? And I didn't know how they were going to be. I didn't know if they were going to look at me and be like, well, that's great, Abby, but um, you have been really rude to us, and you owe us an apology before we can help you. Or I didn't know if they were going to go, well, you know, it's too late. You've been there for eight years, and we've been trying to reach out to you, and you just, you know, gave us the finger half the time, and, and we don't want to help you anymore. I didn't know how are they, they were going to act, and, and really, they could have acted either way. They, they would have been justified in saying either one of those things to me, but, you know, they didn't. They gave me their cell phone numbers. They sat there and listened, and they immediately befriended me, and they had no reason to trust me at all. That was the closest thing I've, I've ever experienced to the mercy of Christ in human form. It was, it was forgotten. It was just, it was over. In fact, um, one time, uh, one of the there was a reporter that was interviewing one of the ladies there, Karen, and um, the reporter said, the reporter wanted some dirt, right, on me, and the reporter said, what, what was Abby like before she became pro-life? You know, how, how did she treat you? What was she like? And Karen said, I don't even remember who that was because she's a new creation in Christ, and that's all I know. And and 
And uh, that was on October 5th. And I told them I, I needed to find a job before I left the clinic because I, I knew we couldn't survive just on my husband's income. So um, they said, okay. So they started calling people and, and asking if they would take a chance on, <laughs> on this abortion clinic director, who they all knew, not in the best way. And um, some people were like, yeah, I don't know. But a lot of people were like, yeah, okay, you know, we'd like to talk to her. So the next day... Um, I went uh, with Sean Carney, who at the time lived in College Station and, and ran the Coalition for Life there, who now works for the National 40 Days for Life. And uh, he and I went to go meet this doctor named uh, Dr. Haywood Robinson. And Dr. Robinson used to be an abortionist. And um, when he and his wife were actually both abortionists. And they had very radical conversions, and now they run a, a pro-life family practice. And so Sean wanted me to talk to somebody else that had been there, right? Somebody else that had gone through kind of this transformation. So I went in and I, I was talking to Dr. Robinson and crying. I, I don't think I've ever cried that much before in my life. It was embarrassing. And, um, and we walked out of his office and I felt so calm. This is October 6th and I looked at Sean, we were staying in the parking lot, and he said, you know, we're working on getting you a job. And this was probably like at 2 o'clock in the afternoon, and I said, I'm leaving today. I can't, I can't do this anymore. I don't know how we're going to pay our mortgage. I don't know how we're going to pay for food or insurance, but I'm leaving today. And uh, I will never forget the way he looked when I said that. He looked like a little kid. He was just so excited. And I went back that day to the clinic and I wrote up my resignation letter and I packed up eight years of stuff. And um, I left that day at 4.30. And I left everything there. I gave him about five minutes notice instead of two weeks. And um, I walked out and that was it. And um, I, I never looked back. I, about three weeks later, uh, Planned Parenthood found out that I was working with this pro-life group. And not working, but like volunteering with them and helping them. And so they sued me because apparently it's illegal to become pro-life. <laughs> and uh, when they sued me, they sent out a press release to the AP. And they said, you know, we are so concerned about confidentiality. Uh, we're suing Abby Johnson. And in fact, we're so worried about it. Here's her cell phone number if you want to discuss it with her. And um, so I started getting, actually, Sean came to me one day and he said, <laughs> he said, your story's on Drudge. And I said, what's that? <laughs> I mean, you say Huffington Post, I knew what that was, or RH Reality Check, I was, I was keyed in, but I had no idea what that was, you know. And uh, he said, it's a big deal. And uh, it turned out to be a big deal. And, um, and I started getting phone calls from media. And um, what was funny was that I had never intended on doing this. I'd never intended on telling my story publicly. Um, but Planned Parenthood was the one that sent out the media report, so thanks, Planned Parenthood. Um, and about a week, about two weeks later, we actually ended up going to court, and uh, it was the strangest moment of my life. It was hilarious, and at the same time, very grieving, because I watched people who I thought were my best friends stand up and testify against me, and um, but then I, I watched my supervisor do some really weird things. Um, she was called up to testify, and I'm not kidding. You can get the court transcript if you want. Um, but my attorney said, what is this really about? You know, I mean, what's the deal here? And she said, well, we're concerned about security. And she said, and my attorney was like, security, what do you mean, like, 
alarm codes or wh what do you mean? And she's like, yes, yes, alarm codes. That would be one thing. And my attorney said, but can't you change the alarm codes on your building? And she said, well, yes. And he said, have you already changed the code? Well, yes. And he said, do you believe that, he was so serious too, it was great. He said, do you believe that Mrs. Johnson is somehow telepathic and will be able to figure out the new alarm code? And, and I'm not kidding, she looked at him and she goes, well, I don't know. <laughs> so that was an interesting day in court. And uh, after about an hour, I mean, the judge had checked out five minutes into it. I think he was looking up what he wanted from Quiznos for lunch. Um, but he, he kind of checked out. And finally, after an hour of listening to them, it was just kind of a circus. And my attorney stood up and said, look, they have nothing. Can we go ahead and get a directed verdict? And the judge threw it out. And I never heard from him again. And, um, and then I started doing this. And um, after I left Planned Parenthood, I didn't know what I was going to be doing. Um, I knew I wanted to work with abortion clinic workers, but I didn't know what that was going to look like. And so um, I had, well, I wrote my book that came out in January of 2011. And I hate writing so the only reason I wrote it was because I thought, okay, if I write this book and just one clinic worker picks it up and reads it, then that'll be good enough for me. Because if I still worked in the abortion industry and somebody came out with this like tell-all book about what I was doing, I would read it. I mean, I would want to read it as a critic, but I would read it. And so I thought if just one clinic worker picks it up, reads it, and finds some truth in it, then it's worth it for me to write it. And so I did. So the book came out in January of 2011, and all of a sudden I started getting emails from these clinic workers that said, I read your book, I feel the same way, I feel trapped, I don't know how to leave. And, um, and so my husband and I started financially helping these people on our own and, and started trying to provide as much emotional support as we could but then the number got up to 17. There were 17 workers that had contacted me and left. And I thought, okay, I got to get serious and start an organization for this. Because there was nothing out there for abortion clinic workers. I mean, we had like hundreds of ministries for, you know, post-abortion you know, women who have had abortions. We have ministries for men who have been involved in abortion. We have thousands of pregnancy centers across the country, but nothing for people like me for abortion clinic workers. And so um, I uh, kind of partnered up with my friend Jenny, and um, who's here, who's pregnant, how many, 20, 20 weeks, 21 weeks? I look preg more pregnant than she does. Um, rude. Um, but uh, anyway, we, uh, we partnered up together and we said, let's do this. Let's start an organization. <laughs> Neither one of us had ever started an organization before, so we really did not know what we were doing. Um, but we got it started. And it was funny because when we were making our strategic plan, we were like, okay, if we have, we were trying to think, like, what would be a really liberal number for us? Like, what would be the biggest number we could even imagine of workers that would come to us in a year? And we thought 12. 12, we would feel very, very blessed if we had 12 workers come to us. And um, so in about a year, we've had 86. And um, so we actually feel really blessed now. Um, but that just, show, I mean, that just shows our lack of faith, right? I mean, it's like when clinic workers leave and I'll get calls from 40 Days for Life groups and they're like, we can't believe it. This worker came to us and they want to leave. And I'm like, you can't believe it? That's what you're praying for. <laughs> and then it happens and we're like, oh my gosh, it really happened. You know, and I'm like, duh. I mean... 
you know, I don't know about you, but the God I serve, he's kind of in the business of miracles. So when we pray for something, he usually answers. Um, and, and so, you know, I just, I don't know. We've just been overwhelmed, really, with the amount of workers that have come to us. And, um, and it's not like they're just leaving, like, I don't want to work here anymore. I want to get a better job because I want to get paid more. I mean, they are leaving because they are having very dramatic conversions on the issue. Or maybe they never wanted to work there in the first place, but they're a single parent, and that was the only job they could get. And, uh, and so they feel very trapped. They're, they're told over and over again, um, and, and we told our employees this too, you know, well, if you leave us, you're never going to get another job. You know, we'll give you a bad reference, and you'll have, you know, the abortion industry on your resume, and nobody's going to want to hire you. And that's just a way to kind of keep these people feeling trapped, and they do. And so we've, you know, thanks to God, we've been able to help these people, men and women, transition out of the industry and into other lines of work, um, other forms of employment, and um, we feel really excited about that. And we, we've seen amazing things happen. We, we kept saying, if these workers leave, they will eventually go back and shut down their clinics. But I don't think anybody really believed us. And then it happened. And we had a, a worker that came to us from Michigan um, she left and she said, Abby, I've got to close this clinic down. I don't know how to do it, but it is disgusting in there. The way that the women are being treated is terrible. I've got to get this abortion clinic out of my town. And we were kind of like, okay, you know, lofty goal. And um, you know what? She did it. She went to the State Department and she went to the city where she lived and she gave them pictures and files and things that were taking place inside that clinic. And that clinic is permanently shut down, never to open again. We have uh, big-time lawsuits. Um, we, we provide free legal help for people that come through our ministry. Um, and so we, we have big lawsuits. We have uh, several lawsuits out alleging Medicaid fraud, um, all by former workers. We have five actually current right now, um, all brought on from, all brought from former clinic workers and alleging terrible things and misuse of money, our tax money. And um, when we are successful in winning these cases, uh, which we will be, each case um, brings an average fine of about $400 million to the affiliate they were part of. And that will essentially shut down these affiliates. In fact, I have a lawsuit out um, against Planned Parenthood Gulf Coast alleging Medicaid fraud. And when we are successful, it will cost them about $550 million in fines. And, and it will shut down that affiliate. And uh, so we, we think big things are, I mean, big things have already happened, and we think that there's more to come, uh, definitely in the pro-life movement and, and also with our ministry. So um, I just, I have some questions here, but before I answer those, I just kind of wanted to open it up to you guys and answer any questions that you have.